Hi, everybody. Someone please confirm if they can hear me okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, I have a few announcements uh, to start with. Uh, first of all, uh, people did really well on the second quiz. The mean was uh, 87%. And uh, I remind you that because this course is not graded on a curve, uh, what that means is that this simply uh, improves everyone's final grade. Uh, so that's good news. Um, I note that uh, homework five, which is would normally have been due yesterday, um, is gonna was extended by 24 hours and it will be due tonight, uh, just before midnight. Um, and that's because some of the questions on there are going to be covered on today's lecture. Um, there's going to be some uh, additional extra credit made available. It's gonna consist of uh, 10 questions in mastering physics and they'll be graded just like homework is normally graded uh, and it'll be worth up to uh, half a percent of the final grade. Um, it will only be awarded though, if the class reaches at least 75% uh, participation in the SRTEs. So I value your feedback and uh, this is a way of making sure that I get it. Um, I will give you more details on the exact timing of this and uh, where the questions will be um, uh, this coming Thursday. So today, what we're going to talk about uh, is we'll start out uh, using classical physics, by that I mean sort of Newtonian and, and Maxwellian physics, uh, to describe the atom, and we'll show that it uh, doesn't work so well. Uh, then we'll talk about something called the photoelectric effect, which was uh, the first hint of uh, quantum mechanics. We'll describe how photons and in fact, uh, other particles can behave like waves sometimes and particles like other times, and even particles that uh, we are positive are uh, particle-like and not wave-like can also behave like waves. And finally, we'll talk about how uh, confining a particle in a small region uh, can lead to um, um, what we consider quant what we now call quantum behavior. So let's start with uh, the classical atom. So uh, last time we talked about uh, the experiment that uh, Rutherford did where he fired uh, um, alpha particles, helium nuclei, at uh, various materials like gold foil, uh, expecting based on the model of the atom that he had uh, to test uh, that most or all of those uh, alpha particles would undergo at most a small deflection as they went through the gold foil. But he found uh, that a number of these, uh, not insignificant number of these uh, alpha particles actually underwent some very large deflections and some of them sort of came back towards him almost. Uh, so evidently uh, matter uh, in general and gold in particular uh, was not sort of this amorphous blob of of the, of the plum pudding model, uh, but rather must have had some hard nuclei, some very dense objects surrounded by uh, sort of fluffy electrons. So with this idea in mind, and, and since the model that most people would have had back then of how this would be set up was that of the solar system where you had so the earth going around the sun, they assumed that electrons would orbit the nucleus in the same way. And as such, the electron would have a total energy that would have two terms. The first term is just its kinetic energy. And this is just one half mv squared, assuming that it's not moving relativistically. And the second term, uh, which hopefully you'll remember from uh, electricity and magnetism, physics 212, is its electrostatic potential energy. And this arises because you have a negatively charged electron and a positively charged nucleus. Um, so these are going to be attracted to one another and there's some potential energy uh, involved there. And, and it has the form of a constant times the product of the two charges divided by the distance between them, R. Now it takes a certain amount of energy in order to uh, ionize an atom or to liberate an electron from an atom. And uh, because of that, we normally say that uh, an, an electron is bound to an atom. And when that's the case, uh, we assign the energy to be negative. 
the total energy that the electron has if it's bound is negative. And all that means is uh, how much energy you would need to give to the electron in order to release it from uh, the atom to which it is bound um, and have it have zero energy uh, infinitely far away where there's nothing to impede it from going. So basically, uh, what do you need in order to liberate the electron from uh, the, the atom and then sort of not have any kinetic energy left over? And that is uh, sort of the binding energy. And that's the amount of energy you need to give it. So therefore, we say that the electron itself has a negative energy. So let's apply this uh, to uh, an atom uh, in the classical way using Newtonian mechanics. Um, and we're going to use uh, a neutral lithium atom, which you may know has uh, three protons, uh, some neutrons, and um, three electrons. And two of those electrons are sort of in close to the nucleus. And they effectively um, shield uh, part of the charge of the nucleus. So the outermost electron, the valence electron, um, sees the sum of the positive three charge on the lithium nucleus and the negative two charge of the two um, close by electrons. So it sees uh, effectively a net charge of uh, plus, uh, plus one, E, where E is 1.6 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And measurements tell, tell us that the energy that's required to liberate that electron is uh, 5.14 electron volts or EV which is equal to 8.2 10 to the minus 19 joules. And we're going to use this, uh, this unit, electron volts, um, which is equal to 1.6 10 to the minus 19 joules, because uh, that way we don't have to carry around these uh, very large negative exponents all over the place. I mean, we'll switch back and forth between joules and electron volts. But just so you know, uh, this is the conversion factor. And uh, an electron volt, one electron volt, uh, has the following meaning. It's the amount of energy that an electron at rest would get if you accelerated it, say, between uh, two plates starting out at one plate at rest, and those two plates had a potential difference of one volt between them. OK, uh, so using our model of the atom, uh, which is an electron orbiting this nucleus, okay. Um, let's find the orbital radius and how fast that electron has to be moving. All right, so first, the total energy of this valence electron is going to be negative because it's bound and it's equal to minus 5.14 electron volts, which is equal to minus 8.2 10 to the minus 19 joules. So then the question is, what keeps this electron going in a circle? Uh, well, it's because it's attracted to the positive charge uh, at the center of the nucleus. Uh, and it's negatively charged going around it. Uh, so if it's going around in a, in a circle, then it's continually experiencing a force. It's continuously being accelerated if it's moving in a circular path, this electron. And that force is equal to the Coulomb force. And that's equal to uh, Ke squared over R squared. And I seem to have changed um, this constant from a lowercase k to an uppercase k in the previous. It's usually written as a, as a lowercase k like that. Sorry about that. Um, so that's the Coulomb force. And we know that for a particle of mass m moving in a circular path, uh, that that equals um, mv squared over r. So we have uh, this expression that tells us uh, something about this electron uh, moving in a circular orbit under the influence of, the, uh, uh, of an electric field. So let's use that, um, starting out again with the total energy of the electron. So it's equal to this kinetic energy part um, and this potential energy part, which is negative because the charge of the electron is negative, charge of the, of the protons at the nucleus, uh, the net charge there is positive. So we get a, a, a residual minus sign coming out. And we set that equal to minus 8, 10 to the minus 19 joules. And I'm using uh, MKS units here because I want MKS units in my answer. OK, and uh, as we just wrote, uh, the force 
is the Coulomb force, and that's equal to mv squared over r. We can re recast this uh, expression ke squared over r squared equals mv squared over r. So this piece and this piece, we can rewrite that to have uh, one half mv squared on one side. And we do that, basically solving for one half mv squared, uh, we get that it's equal to ke squared over 2r. And now we can take uh, this and plug it in here. So where we see one half mv squared in the energy, we can now replace that with ke squared over 2r. And that's what's done uh, right here. And when we do that, we get this uh, simple expression, total energy, which is just minus ke squared over 2r. And we can then set that equal to what we know uh, how much energy it takes to liberate this uh, electron and then solve for the radius. And if we do that, we get uh, 0.14 nanometers. So that tells you that this is roughly the size scale of the atoms, which is consistent with other evidence that, that people had. And uh, you can also solve for the velocity of the electron and you can show that it's um, not an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. It's like 1% of the speed of light. So we can uh, treat it non-relativistically and not worry about uh, too much inaccuracy resulting from that kind of treatment. All right, so these numbers for the velocity and for the radius seem reasonable, uh, but there is a problem. So the question is what happens when a charged particle like an electron accelerates? And, and as a lead in to helping you answer this question, uh, think about what happens uh, at say a radio station when it's uh, trying to broadcast uh, radio waves. What it does is it sends uh, electrons moving sinusoidally uh, up and down uh, basically a, a, a metal wire. And by having those electrons move up and down in the metal wire, um, you get uh, radio waves coming out. So think about how that might apply here uh, and please answer um, this concept question. Okay, please put in your answers. All right. So uh, most people chose the answer C. Um, that's the correct answer. So it, uh, it will emit radiation just like those electrons in the antenna at the radio station will emit radiation. Um, because they're being accelerated, if they're being moved sinusoidally up and down in this, uh, in this electric wire, and this metal wire, I mean, an electron that's going around uh, in a circular orbit uh, should also emit radiation because it's constantly being accelerated in order for it to remain in that circular orbit. Um, so the implication for the model of the atom, uh, this classical model of the atom, is actually rather dire uh, because it predicts that this electron would gradually lose energy and eventually uh, basically collide uh, with the nucleus. And this was uh, referred to as the ultraviolet catastrophe uh, because of the radiation that would be emitted uh, in principle. Uh, but of course, this didn't happen, right? Uh, atoms were stable. Electrons did not continuously radiate energy when they were uh, in orbit uh, around a, a nucleus. So something's wrong with this model. Um, on the other hand, the model does predict some reasonable things. Uh, for the radius, it got that roughly right. 
um, you know, the velocity seemed roughly right. Um, so we weren't too far off, but obviously we didn't yet have the right answer. So just to summarize where we are uh, at this point, um, so it was known that the uh, absorption and emission of radiation uh, light uh, held some puzzles. So it wasn't clear, for example, why gaseous atoms emitted uh, discrete spectra, um, while you know, solid materials emitted continuous spectra that only depended on the temperature of the material and not on the type of the material. Uh, so an atom, which originally was considered to be sort of continuous smear of, uh, of positive charge with uh, little dots of uh, negative charge in it was actually found to have a really dense nucleus with a fluffy cloud of electrons around it. Uh, but of course, as I just said, by classical physics, all atoms should collapse on themselves and they weren't. So that's sort of what the state of affairs was uh, in the early 1900s. And then Einstein came along um, and provided uh, the correct interpretation for, an, for something called the photoelectric effect. Um, which at the time was not completely understood. It was partially understood. And in proposing an explanation that worked, uh, Einstein opened up the path uh, for quantum mechanics. So um, his uh, theory for the photoelectric effect didn't solve all the problems like absorption, emission of radiation and so on, uh, but it did provide some really useful hints for their solutions. So uh, to understand a photoelectric effect, we need to understand the apparatus that was used in order to measure it. So let me describe that here. So it consists of um, a vacuum tube, and that's uh, what I just circled there. And that vacuum tube consists of you know, a solid piece of glass, um, and there were some uh, electrodes, cathode and an anode shown there and there. And then there was this uh, window uh, up here that was also solid glass uh, through which a uh, light could be directed and the light would hit the window at 90 degrees so there wasn't any refraction to worry about. And that light could then go in and, uh, and hit the cathode. And it was found uh, that when one did that, uh, electrons could be uh, ripped off of the cathode or pushed off of the cathode, depending on how you think about it, by this light coming in. Um, and then uh, if the conditions were right, in particular, if you had uh, a negative voltage over here and a positive voltage on the anode, then any electrons that get released or pushed off of the cathode uh, would be accelerated in an electric field towards the anode and you would measure then a net flow of electrons going from left to right, which is a current. And so by putting a, a current meter or an ammeter uh, in the path, you could measure how many electrons uh, were being released from the cathode per unit time. Now you could also change uh, the polarity of these voltages and make say this one positive and this one negative on this side, so positive cathode, negative anode. And now you can imagine that it's going to be harder for those electrons to go from the cathode to the anode, because as soon as they're, they're pushed off of the cathode, they start getting attract, attracted back to it and repelled by the anode. So they're going to have to have a lot of energy in order to surmount uh, that potential difference if, there isn't, if, there, if, some, if, if you provide a potential difference by switching the polarity uh, of the battery. Okay, um, so let's uh, explore this in a little more detail with the following um, uh, demonstration. And, and you can uh, download uh, this simulation and play with it yourself um, after class if you like. So here's what it looks like. Uh, it's the same exact setup that I just showed you a minute ago um, where we have a, a light source and we can adjust the intensity of the light source and its wavelength. Remember uh, that UV wavelengths are very short. Uh, the light has high frequency and is energetic. 
On the other side of the spectrum, you know, in the red or the infrared, the wavelengths are really long, the frequencies are lower, and the energies are lower. So right now we have this set to uh, roughly 300 nanometers, which is in the ultraviolet. And, and the light is shining on uh, the cathode. And the cathode and anode are at the same potential because if you see down at the bottom, that battery indicates that it's at zero volts. And then there's an ammeter there, which is indicated by the yellow bounded box that says current. And right now there's no current flowing. So uh, let's start uh, some, um, uh, some light flowing, uh, some light uh, from the uh, lamp. So I've done that, I've turned on the light and it's set at an intensity of 50%. And you can see that there's some current that's flowing. It says 0.284. And uh, you can see these electrons that are being uh, yanked off of the cathode. And as soon as they're yanked off, they move across to the other side. Now, this is an idealization. They're not all going to travel in straight lines like that, obviously. Um, and there's, there's no electric field here to move them from one side to the other. So the reason that they're going from one side to the other is because they have some energy. And you can see that some of them move more slowly than others. So there's a, a sort of a maximum energy that these can have. And then uh, the energy goes from that maximum kinetic energy down to you know, very small values of kinetic energy. Some of these guys are pretty pokey moving across from uh, left to right. OK, so let's explore what happens if we um, increase the intensity. So if we increase the intensity, what do we expect to happen? We expect that there will be more photons uh, hitting the cathode. And they're sort of like heating up the electrons or somehow causing the electrons to leave the cathode. So if we increase the intensity, we expect the current to go up. So the current is now 0.284. And I'm going to increase the intensity. I doubled it. And you can see now that the current is 0.569. And uh, maybe you can see that there are more electrons going across. It's a little hard for me to tell that. So let me set the intensity back down to 50%. So that behaves uh, the way we expect it to. That's good. OK, and then the next thing I want to do is set the, um, the potential difference between the cathode and anode. And first, I'm going to set it so that it's uh, positive. And what you can see happens then is that these electrons, as soon as they pop off of the cathode due to the light hitting the cathode, they immediately race over to the other side much faster than before, because now there's an electric field that's sort of compelling them to go over there. We could also switch the polarity on, this, uh, on, on, on these voltages. Let me try doing that. I'm going to do it to minus 2 volts, which is uh, just enough to get zero current. And so you can see now what's happening. Even the most energetic electrons uh, can't quite make it to the anode because the electric field is, is now set up in the other direction. So as soon as an electron comes off of the cathode on the left-hand side, it immediately starts feeling an attraction to the cathode on the left-hand side and a repulsion from the anode on the right-hand side. So now you might say, well, what will happen if I increase the intensity? So then I should, in principle, be giving more energy to these electrons. And so I should start seeing some current. So if you do that, we increase the intensity. You see uh, that the current doesn't change. It's still zero. We've got more electrons coming out. But the maximum energy is still the same as it was before, and it's insufficient for the electrons to make it to the other side and for there to be a current measured. OK, the other thing we can do is uh, sort of do the same experiment, uh, but with different wavelength light. So let's choose uh, red light. And uh, we have to clear out uh, these electrons here. So I'll wait for them to all go away. And uh, I'll set the uh, potential difference polarity the other way. 
Sorry, it's sometimes these, uh, this button is a little bit sticky there. And uh, so now what we saw before when we did this with the ultraviolet was we saw these uh, electrons popping off and racing to the other side. And now we, we see nothing, uh, even though the intensity is 100% and we've got almost five volts potential difference, there's still zero current. So evidently, infrared light, even if we leave it on at high intensity for a long time and really heat up the, the cathode, is not sufficient to have electrons get enough energy that they can leave the cathode and, and go across to the other side so that we can measure a current. All right, I encourage you to play with that on your own um, following this link here. Okay, so what does this all mean? Uh, so the interpretation was uh, as follows. First, as the incident radiation intensity increased with the ultraviolet anyway, um, classically what we expected was that the current would increase because we're adding more energy to the, the cathode by virtue of shining more intense light on it. And so we'd expect more electrons to come out, we expect more current. That was indeed observed. We would also expect the higher intensity to basically heat the sample more for these, uh, these waves of light to give more and more and more energy to electrons. The more intense the light was, the more uh, energy the individual electrons should have, the ones that are liberated. So if that were correct, and that means that increasing the light intensity should require a larger stopping potential. And let me define what the stopping potential is. It's simply uh, the value that you set the potential difference to such that none of the electrons make it to the other side. So that's the stopping potential. And you would expect that if you could turn up the intensity and cause uh, more heat to be added to the cathode and therefore more energy be added to the electrons that come out, you would expect the stopping potential to depend on the light intensity. The higher the intensity, the more energetic and the higher the stopping potential you would need. But instead what was found was that the stopping potential did not depend on intensity. It only depended on the wavelength of the light. Secondly, if higher intensity light gives more energy to liberated electrons, then you would expect to see uh, a current that's non-zero, you would ex always expect to see electrons moving from uh, left to right, from cathode to anode, independent of the light frequency, independent of whether it was ultraviolet or infrared. But you, you saw in that demonstration that it worked for ultraviolet, and then we got you know electrons going across, but for the infrared, even at 100% intensity, nothing happened. And if you explore all the uh, frequencies in between uh, ultraviolet and infrared, you would find that at a certain point, uh, there's no longer any current independent of how intense you make the light source. Finally, if this model is correct, uh, that adding more light at higher intensity gradually heats up the, the electrons and, and gives them more and more energy before they pop off and fly over to the other side to give you a current, then you would expect that this current would start to flow gradually. But what was observed was that the current basically flowed instantaneously. As soon as the light source was turned on, as fast as their instruments could measure it, um, they saw current. In other words, as soon as the light source was turned on, electrons were immediately jumping off if the light source had a high enough frequency, short enough wavelength. As soon as that light source was turned on, the electrons were popping off and racing to the other side and causing a current to be registered. Okay, so Einstein came along and uh, provided an explanation for this. And he gave his explanation as uh, a set of postulates. That's how he, he started out. So he said, Okay, first postulate is uh, light comes in discrete units, which they called quanta, and they have an energy that's equal to uh, a constant h called Planck's constant. 
times the frequency of the light. And uh, their light, they travel at speed C. And Planck's constant, uh, you can find more information about that. It's a very important constant, but we don't have time to cover it in detail here, but it's discussed in the text. In the text. Um, the second postulate was that these light quanta are absorbed or emitted uh, in, in integer units, as whole integers. Um, so in particular, whenever a quantum of light hits uh, an electron in an atom, it's either completely absorbed or not absorbed at all. So the electron in the atom can't absorb 30% of a quantum or 1.2 quanta. It can only absorb one quantum of light. And furthermore, uh, when that quantum of light is absorbed, its energy is given to just one electron, not to multiple electrons. So those are his postulates. And based on uh, those postulates, he came up with the following predictions, which turned out to all be correct. So the first prediction was electrons will only escape a metal if the light that's shining on the metal has sufficient energy to overcome what's called the work function, which was, is like the, the binding energy of the electron to that metal. So that's expressed uh, mathematically with uh, this expression here, HF, the energy of the quantum of light is greater than or equal to the work function, E0. And this immediately tells you there's going to be a threshold frequency, namely, if a frequency is greater than or equal to the work function divided by H, then electrons will escape. Doesn't matter how intense the light is. If your frequency is less than that value, no light will come out. No electrons will come out. If you're at a higher intensity, well, all that means is that you're creating and, and, and shining a larger number of quanta of light at the same energy onto, in this case, the cathode. And provided that the energy of the quanta is greater than the energy of uh, the work function, then increasing the intensity will increase the number of electrons and it'll increase the, the current that's measured. The electrons that get liberated will have a range of kinetic energies. And that's because some of these electrons are gonna be right at the surface of the metal. And so when a quantum of energy, a light, hits them, uh, it doesn't take very much for them to get out and, and flow across to the anode. But there are going to be other electrons that are uh, more deeply uh, underneath the surface. And so as they make their way to the surface, their energy will be reduced. And their kinetic energy when they emerge will be smaller than the maximum kinetic energy that an electron can possibly have. And so that uh, maximum energy kinetic energy is given by the energy of the incoming light minus the work function. That's the maximum. And it'll be less than that if the electron is buried more deeply in the metal. So what this tells you is uh, that the stopping potential, which is just equal to the maximum kinetic energy divided by E, so that's just setting if you multiply E across here, E V stop, that's how much energy uh, an electron has to have in order to make it across a potential difference of V stop. So E V stop equals K max. Uh, you can just rewrite that as the stopping potential is equal to K max over E. And uh, since we have here that K max is equal to HF minus E naught, we can rewrite the V stop as uh, H over E times F minus H over E times F naught. And this has the form Y equals MX plus B. So if we plot the stopping potential versus the frequency, then what we will find is that the slope of that line M is the Planck's constant divided by E. So this gives you a way to measure one or the other. If you know one, you can find the other. And um, the intercept here 
tells you uh, something about the work function. Okay. The other prediction uh, that Einstein made was one would expect negligible time delay for the current to start flowing because the light that is produced uh, you know, by this light source, of course, travels three times 10 to eight meters per second. It's very fast. It's going to speed of light um, to the cathode. And then once it hits the cathode, an electron pops off and the electron moves, you know, maybe 1% of the speed of light or something like that, but sufficiently fast that it doesn't take very long uh, for the current to start flowing after the light's been turned on. It doesn't take, you know, some time to heat up the, the cathode in order for uh, current to start flowing. So as I said at the beginning, um, measurements showed that all these predictions were correct. And this provided sort of the first solid hints that things were different at the subatomic scale uh, than they were, or I should say at the atomic scale, than they were at the, you know, the macroscopic scale. So this was the first hint that Newtonian mechanics um, is not, not quite right because we have this wave-like uh, particle, the photon, which is wave-like, we know, because it interfered and diffracted and so on. Uh, but here it's behaving really like a particle. So individual photons are hitting individual electrons, and then you know they're escaping the metal surface and causing the current. And depending on how energetic those individual photons are, determines whether or not that'll happen. It's not a wave-like phenomena where if you have lo lots and lots of waves and you increase the intensity of the waves, you get more energy imparted to these electrons. So I mentioned that if you have um, uh, a plot of the stopping potential versus the frequency, you can derive uh, what Planck's constant is and figure out what the work function is. So let's do that actually. So here's some data. Uh, that we got, it might have been, you know, these points here uh, that were acquired, and then we put a straight line through the points. Um, if we've done that, then using V stop equals H over E times F minus H over E times F naught, which has the form MX plus B, we can find uh, what that slope is. If we look, say, at this point up here uh, at stopping potential eight, and this one down here at stopping potential zero, those two points are fairly easy uh, to use because they correspond to uh, easy to read off values on this plot. Uh, so if you see down here, uh, I've used those. So that tells us using those numbers, that delta y is uh, eight minus zero, and delta x is three minus one. So it's eight, and zero over here on the y scale and three and one on the x-axis. So this is the slope, it's basically, you know, four um, with the right units. And uh, that can then, uh, that then allows you if, you, if you know the value of the electric charge, which could be measured by other means, you could figure out that Planck's constant is 6.4, 10 to minus 34. And furthermore, the uh, x-intercept uh, right here where the line crosses the x-axis is um, the point where the stopping potential obviously is zero. If you look across to the left, that's what it is on the y-axis. And from that, uh, we know that at the stopping potential equal to zero, if you plug that in uh, to this expression here, uh, what you'll get is just that f is equal to f zero. So at that point, Whatever the frequency is on the x-axis, that is F0. And then we can figure out what the work function is by just multiplying that F0 by Planck's constant. And so for this particular set of data, uh, the work function is 6.4 uh, 10 to the minus 19 joules, uh, which is equal to four electron volts. All right. so. Sort of to summarize, uh, what we've seen from previous work is that um, light is wave-like because it interferes and diffracts. With the photoelectric effect, we've just seen that light behaves like a particle. Uh, so uh, one thing you could uh, imagine is that 
if you have large numbers of, of photons, uh, like you turn on a light source and you shine the light on two slits, um, you expect large numbers of photons like that to behave like waves. Whereas uh, for the photoelectric effect, where you're thinking about you know single particles hitting uh, single particles of light uh, hitting uh, a cathode, when you have individual photons, then they behave more like particles. So uh, to explore that, we can do uh, a special kind of double slit experiment. And it's special because we're going to use a really low intensity light source that's really far away from the slits. So that this light source emits uh, just like one photon at a time. And because it's so far away, the direction of the photon uh, is going to be perpendicular, essentially, to the plane of the slits. That just keeps things simple. Um, but the main thing is that there's one photon at a time that's traveling towards these slits. And then uh, on the other side of these slits, we have uh, a screen uh, that, uh, in what I'm going to show you in a video in a second, is uh, what's called the CCD, which stands for charge coupled uh, device. So I should, probably shouldn't have device there. It's charge coupled device um, that uh, produces, uh, shows you where the photons have uh, arrived uh, by you know, uh, showing a little flash, uh, basically a little bright spot. And so uh, what we're gonna do is run this experiment uh, where one photon at a time leaves the source and it goes through the slits, and then its position um, is going to be detected and shown, recorded, I should say, by this charge couple device on the other side. So the question that uh, I have for you is, uh, what's that going to look like? Um, so there's a poll there for you to answer that question. What do you expect these recorded photon pattern, what do you expect the pattern to look like after we wait a long enough time? Okay, so these photons are going through one at a time through these two slits. And then there's a pattern on the screen behind them. What's that pattern going to look like after those individual photons have gone through these uh, two slits one after another for some long period of time? So get your answers in. All right, so most people chose C, a fair number of people chose uh, B. Let me show you the video uh, so you can see what this looks like. So again, this is a video of um, individual photons um, as they hit the screen. And hopefully you can see these dots appearing. This was done uh, at a university in the Netherlands. And so far, it doesn't look like there's any real pattern. It looks like it's just a smear kind of, of photons. But eventually, we will see a pattern emerge. And the pattern that emerges should look familiar. Whoops. So there's the pattern. This, remember, is a result of individual photons going through two slits, one after another. And then this is the pattern that is seen on the screen on the other side of the two slits after individual photons, one after another, have gone through those two slits. So what does that pattern look like? Anybody? Throw it up in the chat. Looks like an interference pattern, that's right. And so the correct answer for this concept question is you'll see an interference pattern. But look at the second part of that sentence, that answer there. What we're seeing is each photon interfering with itself as it passes simultaneously through the two slits. 
kind of weird to think of it that way. In some sense, each photon, which remember this is one photon at a time coming from the source, you could see one dot at a time appearing on that screen, that CCD screen. So we know that that's what was happening. One photon at a time produced on the screen. It wasn't like a thousand came all at once, it was one at a time. And yet the pattern that ultimately arose on that screen was an interference pattern. So what's happening in between when these photons individually are going through those two slits? They, they must be somehow starting out as particles, becoming like waves as they go through the two slits. So it becomes a wave because the only way you can get something to interfere, <coughs> excuse me, is if it's a wave. Particles don't interfere unless they have wave-like properties, unless they behave like a wave. So they behave like a wave when they go through the two slits. And then after they've done the interference thing, they become particles again when they interact on the CCD screen and make a little dot. And the net result of that happening over and over and over again as individual photons go through is you get this interference pattern. Pretty strange. So if that doesn't convince you that there's this particle wave duality, where not only can uh, things be treated as particles or waves, uh, but in fact, they can be treated as both at the same time. Uh, let's consider um, instead of light, which is wave-like most of the time, uh, let's consider electrons, which we really do consider to be particles most of the time. So Louis de Broglie proposed in uh, 1924 that matter could uh, also have wave-like properties. And he showed in particular that the wavelength of a particle is equal to Planck's constant divided by the particle's momentum. And that works regardless of whether the particle is um, massive or massless, or whether it's relativistic or non-relativistic. It applies uniformly. Uh, but I'll mention that while Lambda equals H over P applies for any particle. E equals HF that we wrote down before from uh, Einstein's discussion of the photoelectric effect uh, only applies to photons. And their derivation of that is in this slide. And I'll leave this here for you to look at afterwards on your own. But let's get back to electrons. So if electrons um, have a wavelength given by H divided by the electron's momentum, then they're basically waves with that wavelength. And we should be able to see electrons behaving wavy and, uh, and for example, interfering. And this does in fact happen. So what this picture over here shows is electrons that have uh, been accelerated through 50,000 volts, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually you know, not relativistic even. The electrons have a decent amount of energy. And they're going through two slits that are separated by just a micron, which is pretty easy to make. And they're made, you know, one at a time, and then they're accelerated through this, or they're ripped off of some, you know, some source, some metal. And then they're accelerated through 50 uh, kilovolts. And then they're sent through these, uh, these two slits, which are separated by one micron. And they go through one at a time. But because they have a wavelength, they produce this interference pattern shown here. So this pattern shows you where the electrons have hit the screen on the other side. There's a device similar to the CCD that registers photons. You can get devices that register where an electron hits. So this means that we have a particle, an electron produced uh, you know, by, by maybe the photoelectric effect to you know, release them from uh, some metal, then they're accelerated individually through uh, 50 kilovolts and they see these two slits and then somehow they figure out, okay, a couple of slits here, I'm gonna be a wave now. And then it behaves wave-like and effectively interferes with itself and then proceeds to the screen on the other side where when it hits the screen, it's a particle again. It's pretty strange. Uh, it's difficult to say this in words because we don't really have words 
that uh, that are that are designed to explain these kind of phenomena. But that's what we observe. We observe that they behave like particles sometimes and waves other times. Same particle. Okay, well, let's uh, sort of extrapolate this. If um, the wavelength is h over p for moving things, why don't we see more objects undergoing diffraction like baseballs or cars or physics professors? I see that I'm just about out of time, so let me just finish with this. So let's find the De Broglie wavelength for a baseball pitched at 40 meters per second and for an electron accelerated to 100 volts. And what you see is that the De Broglie wavelength for a baseball is incredibly small. So you need slits to be separated by roughly the wavelength in order to get the fraction or it's slits to have an opening size that's roughly equal to the wavelength in order to get the fractive effects. There is no way that you can make a slit width 10 to the minus 34 meters wide. It just doesn't exist. Can't do it. So you're rarely, it's not rarely, you're never going to see uh, an object like a baseball or a car or a physics professor diffract. Now, the electron, on the other hand, um, has a de Broglie wavelength that's equal to 1.2 nanometers. And that's a distance that can easily be created. Uh, we can make um, uh, openings that are this wide and it even occurs in nature. So, you know, a crystal lattice uh, of a metal, for example, uh, has, uh, has slits effectively that are roughly this dimension. Okay, so uh, I'll leave it there since I'm out of time and we'll pick up with this uh, next time. Bye everybody. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Professor, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, uh, there was an announcement with the quiz to um, questions answers posted. Is that is that like the, um, are we able to see what we got wrong and why we got it wrong? Um, so what's posted is, uh, you know, your question, your quiz and uh, the answer letter. So not the complete solution, we don't post that, but you can then see, oh, I, I, I answered A and the answer should have been C. And then you can, uh, you can ask, um, you know, why is the answer C instead of A, or you can try to figure it out on your own, preferably. Um, um, my, should that appear on the quiz page? Because I, I believe my quiz is still muted. I'm not sure. Okay, so here, uh, I think you should ask uh, Dr. Van Hook. Okay. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how he's posting these. Those are good questions. I, I don't know the answer, but he would be able to tell you right away. Okay, so just send an email or something? Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome.